Number of items submitted for forensic testing, 35. Number of witnesses contacted or interviewed, 71 individuals on at least 99 separate occasions. Number of polygraphs conducted, 9. Number of formal searches conducted, 9. Number of search warrants and subpoenas issued, 150. These are the investigative actions taken by the Office of the Attorney General of the State of Texas in a state that has baffled law enforcement, private investigators, and the residents of the small town of Canadian in Hemphill County, Texas. Today, we look at the Thomas Brown case, a missing persons case that became a, uh, well, nobody seems to actually know. One would think that a case with these kinds of numbers would at least have some workable suspects or theories. But after five years of exhaustive investigation by two police departments and an extremely outspoken flamboyant private investigator, there is still no closure for Thomas's family, friends, or the town of Canadian. Thomas Kelly Brown was a senior honor student at Canadian High School in the little town of Canadian, Texas. Thomas was born on September 13, 1998, and had lived in the town his whole life. Thomas lived with his mother, Penny Meek, his stepfather, Chris Meek, and Tucker, his brother, who was home for Thanksgiving at the time when Thomas disappeared. Thomas weighed 180 pounds and stood 6 feet 1. He was very popular among his classmates and made time for everyone as class president. Everyone around him was said to have enjoyed his eccentric sense of humor. His friend Caleb King said he couldn't think of anybody who didn't like him. Thomas was a starter for Canadian High School state championship football team. His fellow teammates characterized him as a devoted football player who prior to his disappearance had recently decided to change his career path and quit the game. On Wednesday, November 23, 2016, at approximately 6 o'clock in the evening, Thomas met up with several schoolmates, Christian Webb, Caleb, and Michael Castletine. Because there was not much for them to do in the small town at night, they decided to talk, listen to music, and grab a bite to eat. Although Thomas had just split up with his girlfriend, Sage Pennington, he appeared happy. At 11 p.m., the group returned to their respective vehicles parked at the Canadian Middle School parking lot. At 11.28 p.m., Thomas was seen on CCTV filling up his truck at Frank's oil and gas fuel pumps. Thomas's mother, Penny, became concerned when Thomas did not arrive home by midnight, as he never went over his curfew without calling his mother. In fact, he was frequently home before midnight after a night out, to log in online with his friends to play online video games. Penny called him a few times, but received no answer. She gave it a few minutes and tried again, but the call went unanswered. She then called a few of his friends, but no one had seen him. She thought he'd just broken down or had a flat tire and went on to call 911. The Hemphill County Sheriff's Office responded and began searching the city. Around 2 a.m., secondary units began searching the town, as well as Thomas's friends who had been woken up by their families. Tucker, Thomas's brother, rode around with a police officer looking for him. While driving, Tucker noticed a customarily locked gate that was strangely unlocked. He asked Officer Pine Gregory to investigate it, but he surprisingly declined because he said he needed to go off shift. During the evening, Two red Dodge SUVs, like the one Thomas drove, were seen driving through Canadian. However, identifying them as Thomas's SUV could not be confirmed, based on the camera angles employed by the camera systems. One such red Dodge SUV was recorded on video approaching the baseball fields on the sewer plant road at around 6.50 a.m., and was then seen driving up a small hill and parking in a remote area at the bottom of the hill. Helicopters were launched at 7.30 a.m. to search the city and surrounding areas. At 8.45 a.m., one of the search helicopters discovered Thomas's vehicle 
in a remote area just four miles from his home. Hemphill County Sheriff's Office units were dispatched and arrived where the vehicle was parked. They arrived to find the pickup unlocked, one window halfway down, and no sign of Thomas. Family and friends stated that Thomas had always locked his SUV doors and rolled up the windows. Thomas's friends claimed he would not have known about the location, let alone driven down there. Police searched the vehicle and discovered that Thomas's phone, laptop, backpack, and keys were missing. An empty 25 caliber bullet casing was allegedly discovered, as well as a smudge of blood on the inside of the car and a debit card belonging to his friend Michael. Surprisingly, no forensics were performed and the vehicle was returned to his mother the next day. Scent and tracking dogs were sent into the area. They found a trace, but quickly lost it. Over the next week, extensive tracking was carried out by search teams from all over the Texas panhandle, including state and local police agencies, county fire departments, and private citizens from surrounding counties. Investigators then expanded their search to areas 40 to 50 minutes driving east and west of Canadian. Investigators examined evidence indicating Thomas had left the area alone. However, as time passed, that theory became less plausible as he had not used any of his savings, credit cards, cell phone, or computer. Thomas's phone was last pinged at the Wildcat Stadium in Canadian at 12.13 p.m. According to Hemphill County Sheriff's Chief Deputy Brent Clapp, there was no sign of a struggle, and the consensus was that Thomas had run away or had taken his own life. Sheriff Nathan Lewis was new to his position in Canadian, and while he'd had success with drug busts, he wasn't familiar with missing persons cases. Lewis showed Penny a close-up photo of Thomas from that night and asked if it was him. She said it was, but Lewis later denied having such a photograph. It turns out that Lewis and Penny had a contentious history, as Penny had reported Lewis for an incident in 2015 when he traffic stopped Thomas, who was out with his friends. Apparently, Lewis was heavy-handed with the group and swore and berated Thomas. Lewis persisted in pushing the narrative that Thomas had run away, ended his own life, or ran away with an older man. Penny's family insisted that Thomas was not gay and would never run away from home. Penny hired a private investigator, Philip Klein, after becoming frustrated with how slowly the investigation was moving. When the investigators issued Luminol to examine the inside of Thomas's vehicle, they discovered several more patches of what appeared to be blood. An electrical worker discovered a backpack next to a barbed wire fence on Lake Marvin Road on January 27, 2017, two months after Thomas disappeared. This was approximately four miles from where the search dogs had lost track of Thomas's scent. Thomas's laptop was found in the backpack, but had not been used. No forensic evidence was found on the bag, laptop, or surrounding area. According to reports, private investigator Philip Klein requested that a cadaver dog sniff the backpack, but local law enforcement allegedly refused. A mobile phone was discovered in October of 2017. Penny was shown a photo and stated that it was not Thomas's phone because his phone was plain gold, but the one found was rose gold. However, law enforcement stated that it did belong to Thomas. The phone was in nearly perfect condition, with no scratches, nicks, or other damage. When the FBI examined the phone, they discovered that the moisture indicators had not been activated on the phone. Although it is possible that the phone had been left outside since November 24, 2016, it was doubtful. The area where the phone was discovered had recently been mowed and had been mowed several times throughout the summer. Between November 24, 2016 and October 14, 2017, Hemp Hill County received approximately 26 inches of rain. On January 15, 2017, there was also a severe ice storm. 
this would have severely damaged a phone. This wasn't the only odd thing about Thomas's phone. Apple Incorporated records show that Thomas's iCloud account did not contain data that is commonly backed up, such as iMessage and photographs. IP logs and data access logs were also blank, and Facebook records show that Thomas's Facebook page had been deleted. Only the account's owner's password can be used to delete a Facebook account. Due to an online petition initiated by Penny, Sheriff Lewis filed a formal request for the Texas Attorney General's office to take over the investigation in January 2018. January 9, 2019, two years and two months after Thomas had disappeared, Payne Gregory spotted a skull in a thicket of cottonwood trees while searching the area for deer antlers. Investigators soon arrived to search the surrounding area. Within a few hundred yards, they discovered a femur, several smaller bones, a pair of tennis shoes, and some pieces from a pair of blue jeans. They also found a piece of a Texas driver's license that appeared to have been chewed on by an animal. The officers could barely read the license's name, but they had found Thomas. Officers thoroughly searched the cottonwood trees, but nothing significant was discovered. There were no weapons, ropes, or cords that could have been used to strangle someone. If there had been any shoe prints or other potentially identifying marks on the ground, they had long since been washed away. There is no gossip and rumor like small-town gossip and rumor, and Thomas Brown's death spawned gossip and rumors worthy of a movie. The Gambling Ring Theory Thomas's family recruited private investigator Philip Klein in 2019 to find out what happened to him. In October 2021, Klein publicized his belief that Thomas had been murdered. He said that a man named Chris Jones was brought in to play for the Wildcats football team and throw several games as part of a high-dollar gambling ring in Canadian that was betting on Wildcat football games. According to Klein, Jones stated that staff of the sheriff's office, including the actual sheriff, threatened him and Brown and that they were informed they would be murdered if they lost the next game. Jones, who was incarcerated and recounted the allegation over the phone while behind bars, claimed he was paid to throw specific games and Nathan Lewis, the sheriff, was the ring's enforcer. Jones maintains that Lewis blindfolded him and drove him to an unknown location, where, after removing the blindfold, Lewis switched on the headlights, illuminating Brown bound to a chair. He claims that they had been warned that if they didn't throw the game the Friday following Thanksgiving, they would both die. There is no evidence to support this theory other than a man in prison who had failed multiple lie detector tests. Thomas killed himself, and his family covered it up. After Sheriff Lewis requested that his department be removed from the investigation, the Attorney General's criminal section shared the news that two experienced detectives, Sergeants Rachel Cading and Chris Smith, had been assigned to the Thomas Brown case. It didn't take them long to realize that vital information was being withheld by someone in town or the family. The investigators compiled a list of people to re-interview and put through lie detector tests. Lewis and Klein were both on the list. But Penny and her husband Chris were at the top of the list. Penny described the two investigators as pleasant. We basically went through the timeline, what happened on day one, day two, what we did the night that he didn't come home, just things like that. Cading and Smith didn't mention the subject of lie detector tests until the meeting was almost over. They claimed that the tests were a matter of routine. They planned for the test to be administered in the Department of Public Safety offices. We all said sure, because we had nothing to hide, Penny explained. Penny and Chris arrived at the Department of Public Safety offices as arranged with the detectives. Penny agreed to be the first to take the test. Penny said that the polygraph examiner's questions were not asked in any specific order. 
She was questioned many times whether she had been talking to Thomas and if she had moved his body. She passionately said no to both questions. Penny said that after the exam had finished, Kading and Smith entered the room and started questioning her. They didn't say which questions she supposedly passed or failed, but they did say she knew a lot more about her son's death than she was letting on. You know where he's at. You moved his body. You're embarrassed because he committed the arsuit, and you just don't want people to know, Penny recounted the investigators saying. Kading and Smith had listened to a tape of Penny's interview at the sheriff's station in late November 2016, only days after Thomas went missing. Penny told investigators during that interview that she initially thought her son had killed himself. She also said that her family has a history of members taking their lives. Penny's father, who suffered from depression, shot himself in the head at a camping near Lake Marvin in 1998. Penny was evidently so upset that another of her family members had killed themselves that she concocted a scheme to cover it up, according to Kading and Smith. Penny yelled at the investigators, calling their idea ridiculous. She said that she was too small to move his body. I said, are you looking at me? Because I'm not even 5'5". Five five. There's no way I moved someone who weighs almost 200 pounds. I couldn't even pick him up when he was alive. I can't pick him up when he's dead. I can't move a body. That's when Kading and Smith proposed their other theory. Penny said that one of them remarked, Well, we think Tucker or Chris helped you. Did Kading and Smith, two reputable and experienced investigators, have any evidence to support such a claim? Or were they employing an old police trick, claiming to know something in order to get a confession? According to the Attorney General of the State of Texas findings, Thomas Brown took his own life. We at Bad Things tend to agree with this assertion. But what is the evidence supporting this claim? When looking at the 249-page investigation file released by the Attorney General, we have found that Thomas was a troubled young man struggling with his own demons. The most glaring piece of evidence is an internet search for a suicide hotline on Thomas Brown's phone while he was still with his friends on the night of his disappearance. Other circumstantial evidence collected surfaced through interviews with family and friends and included Multiple witnesses said that Thomas battled with his mental health due to his familial history and spiritual concerns. Evidence from Thomas Brown's phone revealed that he routinely joked to his friends about self-harm or dying. One witness told detectives that Thomas was looking for help concerning his mental health difficulties just a few months before he disappeared. In exchange for confidentiality, this witness promised to assist Thomas in getting treatment and driving him to Amarillo. According to the witness, Thomas turned this person down because he did not want to inform his mother, as he was still a minor. Evidence indicates that Thomas had a childhood fixation with wearing diapers, which was known to his family and a few close acquaintances. The investigation showed that Brown's obsession was a significant source of stress and shame in his life, which he had kept hidden from friends for a long time. Brown had recently told a few friends about his diaper fetish, which was confirmed by phone records in the six months before his disappearance. Thomas had recently learned that his grandfather killed himself along Lake Marvin Road rather than dying of a heart attack, as he had previously been told by his mother. Recent events like leaving football, splitting up with his girlfriend, Sage Pennington, and deciding where to attend college have been identified as causes of significant stress in Brown's life. During her first interview with local police, Penny revealed that she felt her son killed himself by playing the choking game. Thomas made several Instagram posts on Kurt Cobain and Judy Garland, both of whom killed themselves. The Attorney General has admitted that there are several unexplained and contradicting pieces of evidence, but is confident that no foul play was involved. The Attorney General made a decision to not bring the case to a grand jury, 
and made the following statement. As of today, this case remains a questionable death investigation without sufficient evidence to conclude that Tom Brown's death was attributed to a criminal act, an accidental death, or a suicide. It was initially thought that a formal grand jury investigation into this case might produce new evidence or leads, but after careful and thorough deliberation, we do not believe presenting this case to a grand jury at this time would be fruitful or ethical. There is insufficient evidence to establish probable cause. Further, the legal standard at trial of beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Brown's death was the result of an intentional or unintentional criminal act is not supported by any evidence collected at this time. It is the long-standing practice of the 31st Judicial District Attorney to not present suspicious deaths to a grand jury if evidence shows the death was the result of a suicide. Unfortunately, Thomas's family has not accepted the official narrative of his death and continues to investigate the circumstances surrounding it. Please leave us a comment telling us what you think happened to Thomas. We would love to hear from you.